as I said earlier, I am excited about this series, not for the topics, but what we can learn from the topics. You know, this whole thing about a hot mess. You know, um, I'm not sure how many of you can relate to that in your family or in your life, but uh, I think at times we all can. Go ahead and put up that next picture, if you would. Yeah. You ever felt like that? Maybe that's you in the middle there. I thought, Olivia, I saw the girl in the middle, and I thought of you for some reason. I don't know why. I'm just telling you, I thought of you. I was like, we all are. We all are. If you're unfamiliar with this phrase, our culture uses it to describe either the things or people that are completely out of control. You know? I did a quick Google search, and I was surprised to discover that there is one movie with the title Hot Mess. Has anyone seen it? All right. There is a weekly podcast called Hot Mess. And I listened to some of those and watched the girl on it, and it was like, oh, she's got some really good points there. There are three songs with the same title, and they're all different and they're all called Hot Mess. And it's like, isn't there a copyright law about having the same title with three different songs, but three different artists, whatever. All right, that's a whole hot mess. I remember using this phrase for the first time to describe our granddaughter when she was younger. <laughs> this kid could scream for an hour and throw a fit for an hour, and you think she would give up. You know, eventually she's going to run out of, you know, anger. But no, no, she could go for an hour. I think we timed her for an hour one time. In the car, on the way back for a trip. I thought I was a hot mess. She wasn't a hot mess. I was a hot mess. This phrase can be attached to all kinds of different situations, different people in our lives. This month, I'm going to be talking about four, four topics. Today is obviously my family is in a hot mess. Next week is my schedule is a hot mess. Week three is my country is a hot mess. Yes, this will be a political message, but I hope you'll come for that. And then finally, my faith is a hot mess. So those next month, the next month, November, I'm going to be talking about the hot mess of our finances. So all month November, uh, we're going to be talking about finances, but it's not going to be called a hot mess. It'll be, you know, another title. So don't worry about that. Um, what's more important for us, rather than just to identify a situation or a person that's out of control, is to look to Scripture and say, okay, what does the Bible say I should respond when I find myself in chaos? When I find either myself in chaos or the situation is in chaos, how should I respond? Are there principles that the Bible offers to help me get through these things without losing my mind? So that's what I want to, that's my goal. So again, over the next four weeks, I'm going to talk about four common areas of life, of all our lives that are out of control, that are a hot mess or chaos. Uh, today, I want to focus on probably the second most important relationship in our lives. Our first relationship is going to be the last message, our faith. But after we take God out of the equation, who should be our first response, our first greatest re relationship. What about our family, our second most important relationship here on this earth? What should that look like when, when it is out of control? How should I respond? And I don't know about you. I'm going to tell some very, very personal stories, some stories that Renee and I are the only two that know in this room. Um, I'm going to try to get through it without breaking down, so I'm going to warn you that. They are real stories in my, in my life to let you know that when we look around here on Sunday morning or any time in life, we look at people and they're all dressed up. They look good. They've you know, put their makeup on, ladies, uh, and then guys have shaved and, and look, you know, look nice you know, for, for all of us. And from the outward appearance, we look like everything looks great. Inwardly, though, and behind the scenes, you may have had a fight in the car on the way to church. That regularly happens. Not always. Yeah. But you could have, you know, arguments throughout the week. You could have, you could be sitting here, you know, um, with someone that you don't like. Or someone that you may love, but you don't really like them. 
you know. You could have all kinds of things going on in your life behind the scenes, behind closed doors, that none of us really realize or know about. Your life may be, you know, I, 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 I've said this before, you know, on the outward appearance, we look so good, and the inside, our life is a nuclear meltdown. We are struggling. We have had a hot mess maybe today or this week. We are in the point of breakdown. We are at the point of, you know, what are we going to do and how is God going to work in this situation? You may be, you know, feeling what I'm feeling when I, when I talk about some things today. So I just want to share with you. When I talk about families, when we say our family is a hot mess, I think I need to identify what am I talking about when I say family. We all begin life with a biological family. Our biological mother and father, sometimes it's referred to as our nu nuclear family. Um, it is our parents and our biological siblings, if we have those. And then there is the nuclear family. And the nuclear family, gets a, it's close to the biological family, but the nuclear family can have a lot of different dynamics to it. It's the family in which you grew up in. It's who your mom and dad were, or who raised you, who were your siblings, whether they were your biological siblings or your you know, step-siblings or whatnot. You know, the nuclear family is your family that you grew up with. There's the traditional family. Again, traditional would be the traditional mom and dad in the same home with traditional uh, biological siblings that you grew up in. There's the single parent family. There's the blended family where there's been a divorce, but there's a remarriage, and often there are step-sisters, brothers, siblings, and all that goes with that. There's the foster family. There's the adopted family, whether it's legal adoption or voluntary adoption, it's the adopted family. Then there's the cohabitating family, where the parents, where the parents are together, but they're not legally married. Then there's the childless families. These are just, you know, a husband and wife that, you know, are doing life together, but they have no children may know them. There's a lot more that I could add, but I won't. You kind of get the idea. Then there's the extended family. Now, the extended family goes beyond our nuclear family. It includes grandparents, aunts and uncles, cousins, nephews, all that goes with an extended family. For the Christian, there is the church family. And while I'm talking about mainly today about our nuclear family, you know, our, maybe our family of origin, you know, and you may relate to that. Many of us know what church family hurt is all about. We know all too well what church family hurt is all about. So this will apply as well. Let me tell you about my nuclear family. You know, who they were and what our life was like, what my life was like growing up. If you would put up that picture, that Owen Mills picture, that is our family circa about 1975, okay, a few years ago. As you can look at that family, you will see my dad has got his arm on my mom, but as you notice the difference, we, the distance between my dad and myself there, I'm going to explain that here in just a minute. If you would, leave that picture up as I describe them. My mom uh, did have several jobs outside the home. They were part-time jobs. But she was mainly a stay-at-home mom for us kids. If anyone of the, have any of you seen the, the TV sitcom, uh, Everyone Loves Raymond? Marie, Raymond's mom, is my mom. Right? Right? Now, I was expecting a big amen, but you raise in your hand. Okay. Marie is my mom wonderful lady at times, can cook like no one that you can possibly imagine, you know, scrumptious meals, just wonderful, but she thinks that she can get into everybody's business, and Renee was never good enough, okay, and she told her, or acted like it, so, and that was like, you know, if you know Marie, if you watch the show, that's my mom to the T, all right, my dad, um, my dad worked at General Motors. He was a factory worker most of, most of my child, uh, childhood. Um, usually worked second shift. He was a good provider. We always had food. We always had clothes. We always had, you know, stuff that we needed. We never went without. Um, my dad got into gambling. Not only was he good at gambling, 
he was better at loaning money at extraordinary interest rates. You know what that's called? Loan shark. My dad was very good at that. He made lots of money that way. Um, in my early teenage years, I found out, discovered my dad was a womanizer. He was running around on my mom, uh, running around on us, and um, that didn't set too well with me. My siblings, my sister there right in front of me, uh, her name is Dottie. Dottie is three years younger than me. And we got along great. Problem was that a lot of my friends wanted to date my sister, and I didn't like that. Because I knew my friends and what they, had in their, what they had in their mind, and I didn't want that for my sister. My brother, on the other hand, is four years younger than me. So when I was able to throw fast pitch baseball, he wasn't young enough to catch it. He wasn't big enough to catch it. If we played football, you know, he was too small to tackle because he would get hurt. So there was quite, you know, an age difference there. My baby sister there is uh, almost exactly eight years younger than me. And so she grew up with me spoiling her saying, you don't need to talk, just point. So I think she was four before she ever talked. Because she would just point and I was her, you know, big brother. Family had many arguments growing up. I remember many, many, many ugly family arguments, mainly between my mom and dad, but occasionally I would get involved. Um, I grew up to the point where by that picture, at the age that I was at in that picture, I despised my dad. I despised him because of what he was doing to my mom. I didn't understand it, what he was doing to us, his way of life. It was not a pretty picture. It might look like a pretty picture on the outside, but I can tell you on the inside, it was a hot mess for me. I could go on and on and on and tell you story after story after story of how that family could be the post poster for dysfunctional family. We were incredibly dysfunctional. And to the point where I went, we went to our, my family, uh, my high school reunion, and to this day, High school friends remember the craziness at my home growing up. And they told us about it, even 45 years later. Man, I remember at your house, blah, 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 blah. And they tell the story. And I was like, yeah, I remember it too, too well. My mom and dad divorced when I was 15, right before I got a driver's license. Um, the relationship with my dad wasn't restored until I was 18. At 18, I realized what was going on in the home. I don't justify my dad's actions, but I saw Marie for what she really was. Now, that's not my mom's name. That's not my mom's name. But I understood how vindictive and nagging my mom could be, a lack of support. At 20, my mom had a nervous breakdown. And my dad ended up with all four of us back in his home. Now, to the point where when my mom and dad divorced, it was so chaotic under my mom's roof that I left home one month before graduating from high school. I moved out on my own. I was done. It was like, this, this place is a nut house. I am moving out on my own, and my dad helped me move out on my own apartment, before I graduated from high school. That is the mess that our family was in. That, that family that looks so good and smiles and looks like everything's fine, you can even see the little smirk on my sister's face because uh, she understood it all so well. We were a hot mess. But that's all we knew. So we grew accustomed to the hot mess. So for us, it was normal. We didn't know any better. Maybe you can relate to my story. Maybe you can relate to the way I was growing, growing up. Maybe you can't. I hope that what I share today will resonate with some of you in regards to not just the mess that you're in or have been in or will be in, but what does the Lord want to do when we find ourselves in a hot mess? Let's pray. Father, I thank you 
that you love us. I thank you for the family that I had growing up, even as crazy as it was. It was the family that you placed me in, and it was a family that you helped me grow to appreciate and love and forgive. A family that, to this day, are close and then distance at the same time. Father, I thank you that you've given me my own family since then. And though we still have our problems at times and our mess that's going on, Father, I pray that you will help us to learn that we can trust you. We can trust your word and we can trust the instructions that you are in control and you have so much better in, in store for us if we will just simply trust you. Father, we may not understand fully what we're going through. It may be our own fault that we're going through a mess. But Father, help us. Help us to achieve what you want for families. Through your word and through your son, Jesus. Amen. To explain about what we're to do, I want to introduce you to the family that is probably pinnacle in the Old Testament. So please turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 15, and I want to introduce you to the family that's called the patriarchal family. Patriarchal family is made up of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. The family is found in Genesis. This patriarchal family was noted for their great faith. But if we look close at their life, we will see they could be noted for their hot mess. The hot mess that they created and the hot mess that was surrounding them. This, this family had its struggles. This family had made mistakes in their lives, creating a mess a lot of times that was in their own doing. Things that they should never have thought to do, and yet not only did they think it, they did it, creating a mess for themselves. I want us to learn from their, their example principles that we can apply to our lives so that we avoid the mistakes that they made. And the first one is, trust God even when it doesn't make sense. Trust God when it doesn't make sense. In other words, never give up on a family member. Never give up on a situation. I told you a few minutes ago about my dad being a loan shark. At 20, God called me into ministry. I went off to Bible college, and my dad was in the midst of all kinds of craziness, stuff going on. By that time, my two sisters had moved out. My brother was there alone. My dad got robbed at gunpoint uh, once, and he got robbed once before the gunpoint uh, robbery. People would never believe in 100 years that my dad could become a Christian, and yet he did, to the point where God so got a hold of his life later on that he was instrumental in starting a church. As a church planner at 80, he was a church planner. Never give up on a family member. By the way, I don't know if I mentioned this, but at 20, my dad and I regained our father-son relationship. And to the day he died, he was one of my best friends. I miss my dad. According to the biblical narrative in this patriarchal family, Sarah was 90 years old when she gave birth to her son Isaac, Genesis 17. And Abraham was 100 years old when they had their first child. But we need to back the bus up a little bit. We need to back up. And we need to see what, what happened 25 years before this event. We don't know exactly how old Abraham and Sar Abram and Sarai were when they got married, but we do know that Abram was 75 years old when God appeared to him and said, leave this area called 
Ur, Haran, leave Haran and go to a place that I will show you. At 75, he went off on an adventure that only God knew where he was going to take him. And Sarah went with him. Uh, Sarai went with him. And it was during that trip where Abraham, Abram was going into the promised land called Canaan that we read these words. And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and him who honor, dishonors you, I will curse. In you, in you, Abraham, Abram, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. By the way, that goes very closely to what I was saying about our position with Israel. Abraham and Sarah were traveling through Canaan, and God reaffirmed in the promised land. While they were traveling in the promised land, God clarified to Abraham, to your offspring, I will give this land. Abraham, all this place that you're traveling, all this will go to your offspring. So God confirmed it to him. By the way, at this time, Abraham, Abraham is 75 plus years old, and he is, they are childless. And so when God makes this promise, they have no children and have had no children for at least many years. When we get to Genesis, 20, uh, Genesis, Genesis 15, several more years have passed. Abraham has communicated with the Lord numerous times. He has created hot mess after hot mess after hot mess for his family. If you don't believe it, look at Genesis 13 and 14. You'll see the mess that he creates for himself and for Sarai. But he trusted the Lord, and yet his trust in God's promise we're starting to fail. So what does Abram think? Uh, I'm going to help God out. I'll help God. I will make my servant my heir. Because surely that's what God meant. When he said your offspring, Abram doesn't work out that way. But he thought he was helping God. And so he said, I'll make my servant my heir. And this is what the Lord, this is what we read. In Genesis 15, 4, And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. God himself showed up to Abraham and said, whoa, dude, don't create another mess. This man, this servant, shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars, if you're able to number them. Then he, that's God, said to Abram, so shall your offspring be. It couldn't be more clear what God was communicating because God was communicating personally to Abram. This is going to be your offspring. And yet, Abraham has no children at this time. And then we read the famous words that are accredited to Abram. And it says in verse 6, And he, Abram, believed the Lord, and, it, it, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Abram believed the Lord, and it was counted for him as righteousness. Trust in the Lord, even when it doesn't make sense. In Genesis 16, though, the very next chapter, more years have elapsed. And now we read that Sarai and Abram are going to try to help the Lord fulfill his promise yet again. You getting a pattern here? They are creating more of a hot mess. And they decide, well, this is what we're going to do. Sarai has this great idea. Well, since I can't have children, then you will, will do the traditional thing. You can have children through a surrogate, my servant, Hagar. To this day, this hot mess is still going on in the land of Canaan. Abraham is 86 years old, Sarai is 76 years old, and they have got a hot mess going on that they have created all on their own. Genesis 17, 13 years later, the Lord changes to confirm his promise to Abram and Sarai. He confirms, he changes their name. He says, no longer are you Abram and Sarai, you are Abraham and Sarah, not a father of many, Abram, but a father of many nations, Abraham. 
Again, they're childless. And for us, I think we need to ask ourselves, would we have believed the Lord after all these years and all, these, all this time that has elapsed that God made a promise and it made no sense? They're getting up there in age, right? And the Lord says, you're going to have not just many, but you're going to have many nations come from you. What promises are the Lord making to you right now that seem impossible? Only you can answer that question. God always comes through with his promise. God is the covenant-keeping, promise-making, promise-fulfilling God today, just as he was to Abram and Sarai. He's not changed. Now, you may not have heard the audible voice of God like Abram did, but that doesn't mean that God is not speaking promises into your life right now. Promises about your family, about family hurt, about family restoration, that it's hard to believe. And yet, God fulfills his promises. It's unlikely, humanly speaking, that Abram and Sarah are going to have a biological child, right? I mean, it's just not going to work that way. In Genesis 18, the Lord... A theophany, Jesus in the Old Testament, shows up with two other angelic creatures who look like human beings. They visit with Abram, Abraham, and they go into his tent and they share with him. Sarah is now listening just outside the tent. And they reaffirm God's promise about this promised child that will be through Sarah. Genesis 18.10. And the Lord said... I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent, at the tent door behind him. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. Yeah, I'd say so. Sarah was 90, and he was, excuse me, 89. Sarah was, eight, Sarah was 89. Abraham was 99. So they had advanced in years. And the way of, the, way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out, the Lord is, and, and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure. The pleasure of childbirth is what she's talking about. All these years have elapsed, and she doesn't have the pleasure of having a child. And she laughs. By the way, the name Isaac, their child, is, in Hebrew, means laughter. So they name the child after what Sarah does, which is they, she laughs at the promise. Sarah couldn't believe it. The thought of her bearing a child was inconceivable. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. It's ridiculous. And yet God fulfilled. And a year later, what happens? Isaac is born, just like the Lord had said. Carrying on the patriarchal promise that God had made to Abraham. Now, I can imagine, can you imagine the conversations that, these, that Abraham and Sarah had around their campfire every night? Should we, get the, should we get the crib ready? You know, is it going to happen? You know, are we going to laugh about this in a few months when we start seeing the belly show? What's, it would have been a hot mess in the conversations. You know, you need to eat for two. Why would I eat for two? It's only one meat. Why would I eat for two? You know, you can imagine the conversations. And yet God fulfills his promise. And the lesson that Abraham and Sarah learned was one of the toughest lessons that we all need to learn. When it makes no sense, still trust the Lord. When physically and, and everything out in the open looks like it makes no sense, God's promise will be fulfilled. Let me tell you a personal story. Back in 1995, Renee and I were, I was serving as a youth pastor and associate pastor in a church. We loved the church. Things were going well. We'd seen the church almost double in the few years that we had been there. Had a great ministry, great relationship with the pastor. Had a really good situation there. We were enjoying life in Cincinnati. 
and things changed. God called us to, God called me to become a corporate trainer for a national automotive company, which meant that we were going to have to move from Cincinnati and leave the security of everything that we had. So what do we do? We start making plans to move to Chicago. I remember coming home when coming home, coming to the hotel one day when we were coming, when we were traveling once a month to Chicago for Renee to find, you know, your job is to find a house for us and find a job for you and a school for the kids, and I'm going to go to work. Uh, it didn't seem quite fair, but that's what, you know, she did. I remember coming to the hotel one night, and uh, she said, uh, well, I found the school that we're going to, that I'm going to teach at, and the kids are going to go to. I said, you did? What did they offer you? Well, they don't have a job. Maybe I didn't hear that right. You found the school that you're going to teach in, and they don't have a job. Yeah, that's what she said. What's the pay structure? Well, we didn't talk money. I said, do they have a place for the kids? Well, yeah, you know, the, the kids will be fine. They, they, have, they have room in the classes for the, for the kids. Did they offer you a job? Well, not really. I said, wait a minute. I'm not, none of this is adding up. This makes no sense. A month later, they offered her a job. We moved to Chicago. She found a house. We found a house. It all played out. But all along, this story, this didn't make any sense to me. I was Sarah. I was laughing. I was laughing all the way until the phone call came while we were in Cincinnati, and they offered a job. And they paid her more, almost double, than what you were making in Cincinnati as a school teacher. I went, huh. I guess you did know where we were going and what school you were teaching at. It made no sense to me. Let me put it plainly. There was a lot of discussions that were hot messes in our home about that. Because I kept saying, if they're not offering you a job, you've got to find a job. You've got to find a house near where we're going, you're going to teach. Because I'm traveling every week. It doesn't matter to me. But you've got to find this. God had already shown her that there was no other option but to trust him. You see, this is the way, the longer you serve the Lord, the longer you walk as a child of God, the more stories you're going to have to be able to share, God comes through even in possible situations. And I'm sure that if we went around this room and asked, has God ever shown up and done the impossible in your life, you could probably tell stories like that too. That God did the impossible. I think God sometimes likes to just show off. And just show you, hey, you can think what you want, but I've got it under control. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. But it all comes down to trust. What about your family? You know, maybe the Lord is trying to teach you. He's trying to strengthen your faith. Maybe he's trying to put you in positions that you have no other choice but to trust him, even as you look at the impossible. Let me give you some key takeaways from from this point. Key number one, communicate with each other. You have to talk with each other as a family. Don't try to help God or get ahead of him. Don't make the mistake of Abraham and Sarah. Don't make that mistake. It never works out well. God doesn't need our help. And when we try to help him, all we do is create a hot mess. Be patient and trust the Lord together. If you're in a hot mess in a relationship or a situation, the best thing to do is come together and say, you know what, I don't understand this. I don't understand why we're at odds with each other, why this is such a mess. But we got to trust each other. More, and more importantly, we got to trust the Lord. That's exactly what God's calling us to do. All right, the story of Abraham is just the first part of the patriarchal family. What about his son Isaac, the son of laughter? Well, he provides principle number two, which is to pour out love equally. The patriarchal family continued in the line of Isaac. 
Isaac marries a woman named Rebekah, and they have twin sons, Esau, the oldest, Jacob, the younger. We get the picture of just how bad this hot mess is in the family when we read these words from Genesis 25. Isaac loved Esau. Yes, dad loved the older one because he ate his game. That means his wild animal game, his meat. But Rebecca, mom, loved Jacob. Favoritism never works in the family. And based on Old Testament customs at that time, Esau, as the oldest, was rightfully the owner of the birthright, which means that when dad passed away, the older, the older sibling would get the double portion. Whatever everybody else got, he would get twice as much. Okay? The family gets even more messy because Jacob has the younger brother. He has his eyes on that birthright. And he ends up tricking Esau, his older brother, to give up the rightful place of the birthright with an exchange of a hot meal because he's hungry and he's frustrated. And so Jacob tricks his older brother to give up the birthright. That's a hot mess. It's just not hot soup. It's a hot mess. All of this goes on without daddy even knowing anything about it. But it gets worse. It's not just the birthright that Jacob has eyes on. Now he wants the blessing. At the end of the life, the blessing would come from the father, and he would put his hands usually out on the child, and he would pronounce a blessing over them. And so Jacob now wants that too. So with the help of mommy, yes, you heard it right, with the help of mommy, he disguises himself to be Esau. He comes in and steals his brother's blessing. To the point where he creates such a hot mess that Jacob runs away from home because he knows now how bad he's created a, an anger, angry brother in this whole thing. Not only has he stole his birthright, he has stole his blessing. And so poor Jacob, that's, not, that not, that's a joke, by the way. Jacob is not poor. He takes off running for his life. And mommy is protecting him the whole way. What a mess. Having favorites never works out in a family setting. There are family members that we naturally align ourselves to. And there are, naturally, there are family members that we naturally are different than. But anytime we play the favorite game... It never works out. It never works out to God's, to God's glory. It always creates a hot mess in the situation that typically either gets, gets worse and worse and worse or God creates some kind of incredible cir circumstance to make it better. I'm not going to tell you how to raise your kids. I'm not going to tell you how to raise your grandkids. I will tell you this. Having favorites never works out. you you have to love them all equally. That's a great blessing of being human. You know, being, you know, the ability that God has given us that our love isn't limited to one. We can spread our love equally among one, two, three, ten kids. It doesn't matter. Our love gets expanded just like God's love can be expanded. By the way, Jesus shed some light on this when he gave this command to his disciples. In John 15, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. In the Greek, it really means just as I have loved you, in the same measure that I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than someone would lay down his life for his friends. That is the kind of love that we should have for all our family members, that we would be able to sacrifice ourselves for their benefit. And Jesus modeled that. Exactly. That his love for us is unconditional, equal, sacrificial. That is the kind of love that we should have for all our family members. I said this a minute ago, a few minutes ago now, that you might love the person next to you, but right now you might not like them real well. Let that set in. You may have had some kind of fuss, mess, happen this week and you're not on the best of terms 
We're just not called to like each other. We're called to love each other. Maybe you come from a nuclear family that unconditional love, that kind of love is foreign. It's not, you know, it wasn't like that when you were growing up. The blessing of being a part of God's family is that we have a heavenly father that can love us unconditionally, equally, sacrificially, every single minute of our lives. I hope you realize that. Types of, this type of sacrificial love requires time, though. It, reclines, it requ- requires dedication and a focus that I am going to love my kids, my grandkids, my aunts and uncles, my siblings. I'm going to love them because God has called me to. And as I said, some, some family members are easy to love. Some make it work. That's what it, they do. They just make it hard. Let me give you some keys on this one. Number one, don't have favorites. It never works out. Look for the blessing in each family member. And by the way, the greatest challenges challengers in our life can become our greatest allies. The progression of this patriarchal family gets even more intense as the family grows. So I want us to look at, so we go from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. Jacob ends up having 11 sons. The youngest of those 11 sons is a guy named Joseph, and that's who I want to focus on right now. And from Joseph, we learn that we need to forgive one another. Spoke about that a few weeks ago about forgiveness. Joseph is the youngest of of Jacob's sons. By the way, there will be one more son after Joseph leaves home. There will be a, you know, a Benjamin at the end. Joseph has a series of dreams. And in those dreams, the first dream, he dreams that basically the interpretation is that his brothers, his ten brothers, are going to bow down to him at some point, giving him honor and prestige, which is unheard of in Old Testament culture. Then Joseph has another dream that not only will his brothers bow down, but his dad will bow down to him, which is never going to happen in Old Testament culture. And yet those are the dreams that God has given him. Joseph makes the mistake by telling them the dreams. That doesn't go over well. His brothers don't like that at all. The family is in a hot mess. One day, dad decides he's going to send Joseph out to check on his 10 brothers. And he goes out there as they're out there herding sheep because Joseph is at home with dad. We read these words in Genesis 37. And so when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore. The robe that dad made for him to show the other brothers, remember favorites never work out, that he was dad's favorite. They could see him a mile off. Here comes Joseph in that coat that dad made him. And they, look, and they took him, they threw him into a pit. I believe that they were expecting him to drown. But the pit was empty. Oh, even better, there got to be snakes down there. There got to be pit vipers. He'll die of snake bite. All right? But it says that the pit was empty and there was no water. And they sat down to eat. Think about how callous these brothers are. They strip him of clothes, they throw him in this pit, hoping he'll either be drowned or he'll be bit by a snake. Then they just sit down and start eating and discuss, okay, how are we going to kill this kid? How are we going to do it? They sat down to eat, they looked, and looked up, and they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum and ball and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Oh, we got an idea, Jacob sa- uh, jo- Judah says. Then Judah says to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother? That was what they were planning to do. A hot mess. They're planning to kill him. Or conceal his br- and conceal his blood. Come, let us steal, uh, excuse me, sell him to the Ishmaelites. And let not our hand be upon him. What a crock. You're going, you were going to kill him. Now you're going to sell him off into slavery. 
hundreds of miles away. And to say, so our hands are innocent? Well, I don't think so. For he is our brother in our own flesh, and his brothers listen to him. And they all agreed, and that's what they do. They sell him, and they think, oh, he's, he, we'll never see this kid again. We're done with him. They make up this big fat lie to tell their dad about how, you know, some wild animal attacked him. And they tear the coat of many colors and pour blood on it and say, see, you know, here's his blood. And, you know, hot mess after hot mess after hot mess, right? They think that they've got rid of him. Joseph goes to Egypt, if you know the story. He has many setbacks while he's there, but God is with him. God's hand is on Joseph. To the point where Joseph is eventually elevated to second in command, Pharaoh puts him in charge of all the country's commodities. Joseph, you are in charge of everything that comes in and goes out of this country. He has he is gone from slave to second in command of the most powerful nation at that day, in those days. Many years go by, and who ends up walking into the capital of Egypt but these scoundrel brothers. These ten brothers walk in, wanting to buy, land, uh, buy, buy food because their land was in a f- severe famine. We read these words in Genesis 42. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. And Joseph remembered the dreams that he had dreamed of them. The question for us today, if you were put in Joseph's shoes, what would you do? Here's your chance. You can get even. Oh, you can get real even. You can get justice. Because these guys deserve justice. Joseph deserved justice. What would you have done? Joseph puts them through a series of tests to find out, have they learned their lesson? Are they still the scoundrels that they once were? Or has time changed them? Has God changed them? Forgiving family members is never easy. And just because you forgive a family member of a wrong or injustice doesn't mean that automatically trust is restored. I want to say that again. Just because you forgive a family member doesn't mean that trust is automatically restored. Trust is built with time and circumstances that you see someone as trustworthy. Forgiving them is not the same as rebuilding or reestablishing trust. My mom had six stepchildren, step-siblings, and then she had her and four other siblings in her family. Her oldest brother is my Uncle Bud. Yes, that's his name. Maurice is his name, but Uncle Bud had two girls, he never had sons, he wanted me to be his adopted son. It didn't work out that way. Because my mom had a brother, her youngest brother, who was only 10 years older than me. And we grew up, my Uncle Kenny and I grew up, and I thought he was like a a brother. He did everything for me, and it was great. And every time I was with Kenny, life was wonderful. And I got around Uncle Bud, and Uncle Bud teased me to the point where you saw that picture. I was about that age, and he came to our house, and he teased me so relentlessly about a girlfriend that I went to my room and cried at 14 or 15 years old. He made my life miserable. Did I like Uncle Bud? I didn't like Uncle Bud. But later I found out What was motivating my uncle to tease me so relentlessly is he didn't know how to show me love. He was trying to build a rapport with me and tease me, but it made things worse. I later discovered this whole scenario about he wanted me as as an adopted son that he never had. That changed everything for me when I realized that he really loved me and he was missing out on what I had with his younger brother, it made total sense. I love my Uncle Bud and have for, you know, our entire marriage, 40 years, 45 years. Uh, I know we're not 45, 42 years. All right. But for years, I love my Uncle Bud. I love my Uncle Kenny. 
But all during those, it was hard to forgive him. Sometimes we don't know what motivates people to do things. We can't get into their head. We can't get into their mind. We don't know why they're doing what they're doing. We need to try to understand how we can forgive them. I love how this patriarchal family story concludes. And we read that in Genesis 50, where we read that Jacob is now dead. All the children, all his siblings are now in Egypt under Joseph's watch care. And the brothers say to Joseph, Genesis 50, 17, please forgive the transgressions of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. See, they own it. And now, please forgive the transgressions, this is important, of the servants of the God of your father. We have been transformed is what they're saying. We are now the servants of the God of your father and of your God. Joseph wept when when they spoke to him. And his brothers also came and they fell before him fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for I am I in the place of God. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive and that they were today and they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. You see, Joseph not only had learned to forgive them, they had learned to forgive themselves. Those brothers had learned to forgive themselves. We need to own it. We need to reestablish trust, never give up. So let me share with you three simple keys of this. We are forgiven in order to forgive, even when it's hard. Forgiveness may be quick or it may take a while. Trust is restored through tests of time. Again, just because you forgive doesn't mean trust is immediately given. So in conclusion, finally, you can see that families are a hot mess. And I don't know what your family's like. I hope your family is nowhere near what these families were like, this family. There'll be times that we'll all face a hot mess in our family. There'll be chaos There'll be storms, there'll be frustrations. But more importantly, how does the Lord want us to respond? Are we going to trust the Lord even when it doesn't make sense? Are we going to love each other equally, sacrificially? Are we going to learn to forgive and give room to reestablish trust? You know, the choice is always up to us. What are we going to do? Status quo doesn't make things better. Status quo just means it stays the same. And if it's a hot mess and you do nothing, it remains a hot mess. Let me give this concluding statement, though. But in your strength, in the strength of the Holy Spirit, you can only do what you can do. There's always two people in every relationship. You can only do what God wants you to do. And you've got to trust the Lord to do what only he can do. We cannot answer or be responsible for the other person and how they will respond. That's up to the Lord. My ultimate question, though, is if you're not in the family of God, why not? Because his family is the greatest family in the world to be a part of. At the end of the service, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, if you're not part of his family, there'll be a couple right here in front by this piano, and they'll be glad to talk to you about that. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you love us. I thank you that, thank you that we have in you a Heavenly Father that is beyond all understanding, that you would so love us that you would give your Son on behalf of our sin. You would invite us to be a part of your family in spite of what mess our family might be in right now or have been in in the past. Father, I thank you that you can do the impossible. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. If you-